its width and its length, its height and its depth. In this letter, Paul doesn't attach anything in particular to those various dimensions of the vastness of Christ's love. But I think we can. And as I said at the first service, the fact that we associate things with those uh, four dimensions of the vastness of Christ's love, it doesn't mean that that's all that it means or that's the only thing that it means. But I would hope as we at least ponder those things this morning that each of us in our own way would grasp more fully uh, the vastness of Christ's love for us. And I'm not going to do it in the order in which uh, they're written. I'm going to do it in a different order for my own purposes. And so I would like to start with the depth. Is How deep is the love of Christ? I mean, don't, don't say anything out loud. I just want you to, to, to think about that for a moment. Is how deep is the love of Christ? That, that word speaks to me in a way that as we think about the, the, the depth of the love of Christ is that it is deep enough to reach us where we are. That he doesn't have some uh, cutoff line and if you're down here, oh sorry, you just missed the mark. I can't reach quite that far down. Um, but wherever we are and however deep down we are, Christ's love still reaches us. And if we go back to um, Ephesians chapter 2 where he talks about our natural state, he says that by nature we are dead in our transgressions and sins. That by nature we don't love God and we are not interested in the things of God. That by nature we are inhabiting the grave and awaiting that final judgment until Christ's deep love reaches out to us. And more than reaching out to us in the midst of our sin and death, Jesus makes us alive. I mean, those are you know, so many glorious verses in this letter, but in that second chapter, but because of his great love, and why don't we say because of his deep love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I've shared this once or twice over the years, but during my second year of seminary, I had what can only be called the dark night of the soul. You would think seminary is a happy place to be. Uh, it was. I mean, it, the Lord is, is doing his, 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 his own work, but, but during my, my second year of seminary, I had this uh, very intense dark night of the soul. And, and the way in which mine manifested itself was that I was haunted by the sins of my youth. I mean, all of us have a past. I'm no different in that. And uh, during that season, it was as if my uh, former wayward life... Um, You know, all the things that I had long since forgotten and many of the things that I had kind of glibly confessed, it was like there was this parade uh, before the eyes of my heart. And I was terrified. Probably in a way that I'd never been terrified before. And this went on for, I don't know how many days, that was a rough week. And and during that week, it was as if I felt the weight of my sin in a way that I'd never experienced before. It was as if the Lord's heavy hand was upon me, like crushing me. And during those days, I still went to class, and then I came back to my dorm room, and I just sat there and like, what in the world is happening to me? But I tell you this story because in the midst of my shame and despair, the deep love of Christ reached me. 
that the Holy Spirit quickened my spirit, reminding me of the depth of Christ's love, not just for the world, but for me, Jeffrey. And when I went back to my uh, dorm room after class and dinner and so forth, I didn't sit in the dark. Uh, I poured over the scriptures. I figured if there was going to be any relief, if there was going to be any comfort, uh, it would be found there. And it was as if, as I turned the pages, the Holy Spirit was turning the pages, and I came to passages like, um, while Jeffrey was yet a sinner, Christ died for him. That there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, including me. That there is nothing in all of creation, nothing that I had done and nothing that I had failed to do could separate me from the deep love of Christ. And what is true for me is also true for you. How deep is the love of Christ reaching out to meet us where we are? But Paul's prayer is not that we would only know the depth of Christ's love, but that we would also know the length of Christ's love. And as I think about the length of Christ's love in in light of this uh, letter to the Ephesians, uh, verses uh, 13 and 14 from that opening chapter are what struck me, what kind of captivated my mind and heart. He says, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. Yes, I know the word is not love. The word love is not mentioned in either one of those verses, but love is what serves as the foundation for all those things. Christ's Deep love meets us where we are, makes us alive in him, and Christ's long love sees us throughout the entirety of our lives. Think about it, is that Jesus' love is for all of the seasons of life, amen? Uh, Jesus' love for us is for today, Jesus' love for us is tomorrow and always. And what strikes me about that and the comfort that we have is that While we await the the fullness of that inheritance, um, our assurance that one day we will receive that is not dependent upon how hard we hold on to Jesus. Uh, It depends upon his hold on us. Years ago, and for some of you, I've told you this, but uh, an acquaintance of mine, uh, when we lived in New York City, He was in Manhattan one day, and he saw a father and son crossing the street. And his son was maybe about four years old. And before they crossed over, they held hands. And his son undoubtedly thought, I'm holding on to my dad's hand. You know, and he said, you know, a sense of safety and security. For those of you uh, who have children or who had children that were young, when you're crossing a busy street, who is holding on to who? Um, you know, when the boys were small, I would grab them more around the wrist. I wasn't holding on to their hand. I was holding on to the wrist because they could not so easily slip out. And as we think about the length of Christ's love for us, the fact that we will persevere in the faith until faith gives way to sight is not because we hold so firmly to Christ, but because Christ himself holds firmly to us. Christ's love is deep enough to reach us in the depths of our sin and death. And Christ's love is long enough to see us through all of the seasons of life until we receive that inheritance in full. And it is wide enough to embrace all people. 
to unite us in him and to join us together. And that's been the focal point. If you've been here the last two weeks, that has been the focal point, is that Jesus Christ's love is wide. In love, Ephesians chapter 2, he breaks down that wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, and I would say between all nations. Uh, that's a reality, um, it's not yet been fully realized because we still have a lot of disunity among those who are in Christ. And so there's yet work for the Spirit to do in our lives and in the lives of others. But in love, the dividing wall has been broken down. And then in chapter 3, which we looked at last week, in love we are heirs together, members together, um, and Patty J. pointed that out in, in uh, the discipleship class, and that it's the together, the together. He's making a point that we're members together, heirs together, and shares together in the promises of Christ. If you think about um, the embrace of Christ, it, it's, it's wide enough to include all people. Uh, that glorious image in Revelation where he saw individuals from every nation, tribe, people, and language. That is how wide is the love of Christ. If it wasn't that wide, uh, maybe um, he doesn't like Swedish people. You know, um, maybe if his embrace isn't that wide, he really doesn't like Italian people. Sorry. Who doesn't like Italian people? But, you know, it's, you know... <laughs> If it isn't that wide, then all of us have to live in doubt as to whether it is wide enough to embrace us. But the love of Christ is wide enough to embrace people from every nation, tribe, language, and people. The depth, the length, the width, and that leaves us with what? The height. And I purposely chose to leave this to the end because it so wonderfully bridges the gap between the first three chapters and the last three chapters. Because what we see in the final three chapters is how the love of Christ raises us to new heights. How the love of Christ for us raises us beyond our self-love that we might love God more fully with all that we are. And in very practical ways, the love of Christ reaches, raises us to new heights whereby our lives testify to the degree that we have grasped the vastness of Christ in our interactions with others. Uh, especially members of the household of faith. Contrary to what some of you might think, I, I don't live in an ivory tower. I live in the house right across the parking lot. Um, you know, I, I don't stick my head in the sand. I live in the same real world that you do. Um, and so as we look at the world around us, and as we examine our own lives, we can see some pretty glaring examples of failure. Uh, repeated examples of failure to love others well. And when we see that again and again and again, it's disheartening. Let's just state the facts. It is disheartening. And at times it plants the seeds of doubt in our mind. We wonder is, what, what Paul is saying here, is he talking about the ideal or is he talking about the real? What could really take place in our lives as followers of Jesus? And if he is, maybe he's talking about somebody else because it doesn't seem to be working very well in my own life. But the truth is, Transformation is happening. The challenge for us is it doesn't happen very quickly. Um, I, was a, a, I was a late bloomer, and so I was about, you know, this tall until, I don't know, I was 30. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I was a really late bloomer. And um, so 
I couldn't wait till I, you know, started to grow. I'm still, you know, with like a couple of extra inches, but probably, at, you know, in 50s is not going to happen. Um, here maybe, but not here. Um, so so I, I couldn't see myself grow. I couldn't stand in front of the mirror and you're like, oh, I see that I've gained a half an inch. <laughs> you know, I, I, there could be a mark on, you know, houses, you know, you've got the little mark in the ha- hallways. Ooh, I'm as tall as my oldest sister now. You know, th- I could see progress, but that was progress over months or over years. And sometimes as we look at our own lives, we say we don't see any transformation. And moment by moment, we rarely see that transformation. It's only over the course of time that we see that the love of Christ is actually transforming us. And that's why I love uh, the inspiring doxology with which he ends. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine as we stand before the mirror saying, when am I going to grow? Or as we examine our lives and say, when am I going to be transformed? When is it going to be easy for me to love others? When is it easy going to be easy for me to love God with all that I am? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. With these words, Paul encourages us. True change is possible. With these words, Paul encourages us. True change is not only possible, true change has come and is coming. We are in the process of being transformed. That the Holy Spirit is in the midst of us, transforming us, all because of the vastness of Christ's love for us, a love that reaches us where we are, a love that sees us through all of the seasons of life, a love that's wide enough to embrace us and all nations, and a love that raises us to new heights. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, it ought to strike all of us as somewhat strange, as Paul writes, that we might know the unsearchable uh, riches of your love, And how can we know the unknowable? And yet we pray that by your spirit that you would enable us to grasp more fully the length and the breadth and the height and the width of your love for us and for all people. And that that vast love would raise us to new heights, that we would rest more securely in your love and grace for us, that we might love you more fully and that that transformative love might be seen in the way in which we live among others. We pray all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.